It is often argued that the intricate web of alliance systems that Bismarck had brought into being ultimately proved to be a liability for German foreign policy establishment for the two decades and a half uh, after his fall leading on to the First World War. As we have already discussed, alliance systems that Bismarck brought into being were handling conflicting interests by Bismarck's allies. So historians like Taylor, Hildebrandt, Ritter argue that this dynamics that Bismarck had brought into being of conflicting alliance commitments ultimately compromised the maneuverability that his successes could have had. There are, however, other historians who argue that there was really no sharp disjunction between the Bismarckian and the post-Bismarckian era. Also, that the alliance systems that Bismarck brought into being were not conjured by the autonomous dynamics of foreign policy. They would argue that Bismarckian foreign policy developed in the way it did because of major domestic economic considerations, that the dynamics released by the German economic development f all through the 70s and 80s ultimately made the choices of diplomatic allies that Bismarck did. In fact, they would argue that in many ways, Bismarck actually tried to go against this grain and that eventually his alignment with Russia by the reinsurance treaty and his fall from power in 1890 was because he could not come to terms with these changing economic realities that Germany was facing. Historians like David Callio and Fritz Fischer, Emanuel Geis, but most importantly Hans Ulrich Weller argue that the entire diplomatic system of alliances that Bismarck had conjured and brought into being were dominated primarily by the economic considerations which come out they would say, in the archetypal case of the dual alliance. In 1879, the treaty that Bismarck signed committing Berlin to supporting Vienna in any war in which Vienna was a victim of Russian aggression was a very clear indicator of how close the two powers had become. Historians like Kellio and Hans Ulrich Weller argue that the principal consideration was not, as Taylor argued, to keep the predominantly Catholic population of Austria out in case the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed. They would argue there were actually very few reasons to believe the Austro-Hungarian Empire was on the verge of collapse. Historians like Weller argue that the entire rationale behind at going closer with Austria-Hungary was economic. In the 1870s, the German industrial uh, development that had characterized German economy from the 1840s onwards, right after the unification, began to slow down. From the mid-70s, Germany was entering what is known as a period of retarded growth. And at that point of time, German industry, German commerce, was no longer the keen advocate of free trade and laissez-faire that it had been till that point of time. By the late 70s, there was growing pressure from the German industrial lobby that the German government should make it convenient for German industry and German trade to promote or to sort of expand outside the horizons of Germany, that there should be state support for industrial and economic expansion. And this, Heweller and Kellio remind us, was probably the driving imperative behind the dual alliance. Because by closely aligning Austria-Hungary with Germany, Austria-Hungary was meant to be, as it were, sucked into German economic orbit. And given the fact that the Austro-Hungarian Empire spanned over the entire Danubian region, the Danubian principalities of Slovakia, Moravia, Moldavia, Bohemia, all of these regions could serve two functions. The industrial regions of the Czech lands of Bohemia and Moravia and Croatia could provide Germany with finished goods, 
as also semi finished goods and minerals. The agrarian regions of Slovakia of Moldavia could provide Germany with raw materials for industry. Basically the Austro-Hungarian Empire was to be the economic hinterland that Germany was going to need at a time when there was when, when the economic expansion in Germany was slowing down. This is popularly known as the, pop, the policy of Mittelo Europa. Germany wanted to dominate Central Europe. And historians like Kelio and Weller would argue that it was this economic imperative that pushed Bismarck towards Vienna. That although for foreign policy reasons he continued to desire proximity with Russia and keeping Russia and Vienna together, it was the economic dimension that made Bismarck choose the one over the other. Similar arguments are brought into being by uh, are brought forth by people like Weller and, Ar uh, and Kelio with reference to Bismarck's subsequent policy of trying to align with France, his sham colonial adventure or even the reinsurance treaty and the things that uh, went along with it. It is argued that Bismarck's actual, um, that Bismarck was actuated by the motive of a genuine colonial expansion when he proposed in 1884 that Africa should be opened up to European colonial power. Also that his desire to ally in France was not to conflict with his desire to open the colonies because in the German Reichstag, in the German industrial lobby, there was considerable pressure being uh, beginning to grow in favor of imperial expansion outside. This was a policy of Middle Africa, whereby Germany was to expand into Africa and develop colon colonies in there, from which would be market for German industrial goods, as also source of raw materials, cheap raw materials, which would uh, do a world of good to the ailing German industry in the 1880s. And the historians argue that if Bismarck did not push vigorously, it was largely because he had other considerations in mind. But when he actually proposed the policy of Middle Africa and the partition of Africa among European powers, there was no reason to believe it was prompted by the consideration of aligning with France. That was to be only an incidental byproduct, as it were. That there was a genuine lobby working in German foreign policy establishment for the promotion of full colonial empires. The other argument about the reinsurance treaty and Bismarck's fall that was occasioned, historians like Weller and Kalio would argue that Bismarckian position on the reinsurance treaty was not a very simple position. While Bismarck was pushing for a close military alignment with Russia with the reinsurance treaty, he was also at the same time invoking Russian wrath. What happened was that in the mid 80s as Russian industrialization was beginning to acquire some momentum, Russia wanted to mobilize foreign capital and they tried to first raise money from the stock exchange in Berlin. Bismarck came under tremendous pressure from the industrial and financial lobby of Germany that ultimately foiled Russian bid to raise money from the German capital market. German industry was afraid that if Russian industry developed very quickly, then Germany would lose one of its potential markets in Europe. Also, they considered that any investment in Russia was to be in the long run counterproductive for German industrial and financial interests. Hence, at the time when Bismarck was actually pushing for the reinsurance treaty, was persuading Kaiser to go with the reinsurance treaty, he was also invoking Russian wrath by, um, by sabotaging their attempt at raising capital in uh, the German market. It was no coincidence, therefore, that in the reinsurance treaty, Russia suggested that if France attacked Germany, Russia would remain neutral. But if Germany attacked Russia, Russia would intervene on behalf of France. The reason was by this time, having been foiled in Berlin, Russia was beginning to raise capital 
in France. Kelly and Weller would therefore argue that the trajectory of alliance systems that were developing even during the Bismarckian era were dominated heavily by economic considerations. And they would argue that Bismarck's fall from power was also a result of the fact that Bismarck and the Kaiser could not agree on the general direction in which German society, economy and polity had to grow. Bismarck wanted to come down heavily on the rising social democratic movement. The Kaiser was willing to go a bit easy and it was on this particular issue that Bismarck eventually was dropped from the cabinet. The era that followed Bismarck which is known as the Wilhelmine era after the uh, Kaiser himself. The eponym, however, is not because the Kaiser was the principal factor in shaping German foreign policy this period. He was providing merely the guiding influence. The nitty gritties were worked out by four chancellors, von Caprivi, von Hohenlohe, von Bülow and Bethmann Holweg. But none of these four were able to measure up to the status and influence, the stature and influence of Otto von Bismarck. Hence, we speak of this era as the Wilhelmine era. There were major shifts within the Wilhelmine era, as historians have already told us. To start with, von Caprivi. Caprivi had started with a return to the original Bismarckian and German policy of free trade. By the 1890s, Europe was gently coming out of that economic depression-like situation and Caprivi inaugurated a series of free trade treaties with Britain, with Austria, Hungary and Russia, which ended up by expanding German economic horizons. The general idea was that if commercial exchange between the powers would grow, then industry would have a larger market to cater to. To an extent, this ultimately really worked. The consumer goods industry particularly flourished during the Caprivi era of free trade, with treaties being signed from around 1892-93, spanning for a period of around four years. The period of Caprivi was a period of unprecedented economic prosperity in Germany. And this was also the period when, for the first time, the one diplomatic prize that eluded Bismarck, alignment with Britain, began to look like a real possibility. With the free trade era dawning, Britain and Germany began to draw closer to each other. And even at a time when France and Russia were drawing close to each other with the military alignment of 1892 and deepening economic ties of 1893, Germany refused to be alarmed. For a time it seemed that the German establishment was recovering from the paranoia about diplomatic isolation and France's growing ascendancy. Caprivi, under Caprivi, Germany seemed to have the maturity, the confidence and the freedom from insecurity that was almost breathtaking in its departure. Also during the Caprivi period, we see the first real push towards the colonial empire. That the German industry needed to expand its market horizons and this required political support Caprivi did not deny. So Germany for the first time decided to go for a very serious push in Africa and even in 1895 on account of the Sino-Japanese war Germany even made its initial foray into Asia by capturing Shanghai uh, in order to prevent, in order to preempt even British interest developing. Domestic political considerations ultimately led to an end of this free trade honeymoon because von Caprivi came under a major attack from the very same forces that had once engineered Bismarck's own downfall. As Hans Ulrich Weller informs us that towards the closing years of the Bismarckian era there was a major social coalition that had emerged known as the coalition of the aristocratic Rai agrarian lobby with the bourgeois iron. Weller argues that during the closing years of the Bismarckian era, the gradual drift away from Russia was triggered by the fact 
that not only was Russian industry proposing to become a competition to German industry, but also because Russian grain exports to Germany was depressing grain prices in Germany itself, which meant that the conservative Juncker agrarian lobby in Germany was suffering as a result of the Russian connections. Hence, the almost urge to push Russia away. Weller argues the same consideration came back as a result of the free trade treaties of Caprivi, that the German agrarian lobby was concerned at the manner in which, as a result of the free trade treaties, Russian, then American, and then finally Canadian grains began to be dumped on the German market, pushing agrarian prices. Also, the German industry, after more or less more than a decade and a half of protectionist measures, were not really forthcoming in going for free trade, especially German heavy industry, because the scale of development within Germany could no longer expand very fast, while consumer goods durable, consumer durables were becoming important considerations for German industrial expansion, heavy industry had begun to suffer from free trade. So German heavy industry began to team up with the agrarian lobby in the mid 90s and triggered the ouster of von Caprivi. Von Caprivi was succeeded by the arch protectionist Chancellor von Hohenlohe. Now Hohenlohe, coming from an agrarian background himself, was in full sympathy with the German agrarian lobby. Problem was that the Caprivi treaties were time bound. They were for a period of sometimes five years, sometimes six years. So till that period came to a close, nothing could be done about it. So Hohenlohe decided to give the, the, the rye and iron combination, a different kind of thrust by embarking on a very expansionist uh, imperial navy policy. And this coincided with the Middle Africa and Middle Europa policy and moved towards the next leg in German foreign policy theory, which is Weltpolitik. The Germany had to become a world power. The Germany had to devise a navy that would be that would make it capable of projecting a world power. And the Kaiser, the, M, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm II had full support behind uh, this Hohenlohe program. So Kaiser Wilhelm began to give German brinkmanship a new dimension in incidents that really should not have concerned Germany. The best example is the case of the Jameson raid in uh, the Boer uh, Republic and the manner in which this almost triggered a war. The Boer Republic of Transvaal, dominated primarily by Dutch settlers, had an understanding with the British colony of South Africa that Transvaal would remain for all practical purposes autonomous with the proviso that all its foreign policy would be, co would be covered primarily by the British. Now Transvaal was rich in diamond resources and the British from Cape Colony, in fact Dr. Jameson who was a disciple of uh, Sir Cecil Rhodes, was found to be triggering a conspiracy that would result in a uh, change of guard in the Witlander dominated Republic of Transvaal where Jameson then would be able to uh, ensconce British interests more firmly. Now, when this story came out, the, uh, there was a furor about intervention and the Germans tried to find out whether the British government was in any way involved in it because that was in violation of the treaty that the British had signed with Transvaal. It came out that the British government was not uh, embarking on this brinkmanship. Jameson was behaving like a loose cannon. There, the matter should have rested. But what the Kaiser did in December 1896, that he actually sent a telegram congratulating the uh, president of the Transvaal Republic that he had successfully kept foreign forces away. Now German concern about Transvaal was pretty understandable because the Germans had major stakes in the Deutsche Bank, Germans had major state uh, invest, uh, investment in uh, the Transvaal Republic with Siemens setting up the electrical sector in the region. So Germany had legitimate reasons to fear 
British intervention. But the congratulation, congratulatory telegram that Kaiser sent to the, uh, the president of the Transvaal Republic stood in violation of the uh, provisions of the Boer British Treaty. And this resulted in a major diplomatic outrage and Germany was uh, made to lose a major face on this crown. Hohenlohe's Middle Africa policy had several other such irritants from time to time. The problem was that none of, uh, none of the major policies were pushed very successfully. The real change comes with the coming of von Bülow in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at a time when Hohenlohe was basically getting his grips over the uh, chancellorship. Von Bülow, under the leadership of, uh, under the guidance of Hohenlohe, began to push for a major naval program, which was promoted by the German Admiralty, led by Admiral Tirpitz. In 1897, the Tirpitz plan, which was introduced in the Reichstag, proposed that the size of the German Navy should be expanded several fold so that Germany could project its power overseas. The naval build, the navy plan, as it was called, was meant to be a sop for both the colonial lobby and the industrial lobby because the colonial lobby was going to get its colonies that it had already been promised but which had never been delivered. The navy was important uh, for the German industry, a naval build-up was important for German industry because it would provide for new jobs, new, a uh, larger number of jobs in the heavy insect industrial sector, which had till this point of time been neglected. So it was meant to be a good social program. Problem was that it had to come with another theory and a more, uh, exp uh, let's say more elaborate uh, development in terms of wealth politic. What was to be wealth politic? The Germany was to have a global present. Germany, as the Kaiser will, as Kaiser Wilhelm was to say, deserves Ein Platz an der Son, a place under the sun. And having a navy would enable it to project German power across the seas. Hohenlohe managed to bring the free trade treaties of Caprivi to a close. None of these were renewed, and he began to push for a naval buildup. Nevertheless, he fell foul of the establishment when it came to his dealing with the Social Democrats. Hohenlohe was in favor of a major uh, crackdown on the Social Democrats and when this was not working, at a time when he was physically not ill, he was gently removed and replaced by von Bülow. The coming of von Bülow was basically the peak of wealth politik as a doctrine. Germany began a very fast development of German Navy. This, however, created a major international complication because German Navy was way behind the British. Nevertheless, the British Navy operated on the principle of what was known as 2 plus, that the two largest naval powers after Britain with their powers combined should not be able to threat Britain. With the German naval expansion beginning as it did, the British were beginning to be afraid that Germany was aspiring for world domination and would actually threaten British's supremacy on the high seas. So from, the eight, from 1899 vaguely and by 1900 definitely, the British began to push for some kind of an understanding with the Germans, that there should be some kind of a negotiated regulation of how large the German na naval force was going to be. The British under Joseph Chamberlain began to push for, an for a regime whereby the German Navy, the size of the German Navy would be given a ceiling beyond which it would, be, beyond which it would not go. For political reasons, von Bülow could not respond. Make no mistake, if Germany had made friends with the British at this point of time, this would finally have given Germany what Bismarck had always desired but failed to achieve. With Britain firmly on its side, France would not have posed Germany any threat 
because then France would have the prospect of a two front war. But for domestic political reasons, von Bülow dared not respond because the policy of naval program was integrated into a larger policy geared basically to handle the problem of social democracy in Germany, in German domestic politics. This was known as the policy of Sammlungspolitik whereby all the various forces of German society, the various segments would be brought together. And a fresh build up of the navy would mean industrial jobs in the industrial sector, heavy industry would be happy, the laborers would be happy. The middle class was looking forward to a recruitment in the German Navy, so they would be happy. And the German agrarian lobby, in return for voting this particular thing through, the uh, expensive Navy program through, was looking for protectionist regime on agrarian uh, imports. So, for domestic political considerations, von Bülow did not dare break out of Samlung's politique and ultimately went on to antagonize the British. After the British failed in bringing Germany back on board in 1903-1904, they began to look for allies elsewhere. By 1902, the British had signed a treaty with Japanese, taking care of their Asiatic empire. By 1904, France was on board. By 1907, the British had settled their colonial dispute with Russia as well. It was clear by 1907 that as a result of Germany's adventurous foreign policy driven by its domestic considerations, if there was to be any war in the future, Germany and Britain would be found on the opposing sides. By the time von Bühler left office and Bethmann Holweg came, it was very clear that any confrontation between Austria-Hungary and Russia over the Balkans or between Germany and any other power in any other part of the world would invariably bring Britain on the side opposed to the Germans. So the basic thrust of German foreign policy of preventing diplomatic isolation and keeping France isolated by the domestic uh, on account of the domestic factors shaping German foreign policy could no longer manage to safeguard the original objective. The, the direction that German foreign policy was being pushed by the logic of Germany's economic evolution made certain that by 1910 Germany was to have only one ally remaining in the European Pacific, in the European theater, Austria-Hungary. Bismarckian idea of being a part of a troika in a Europe of five powers had now been reversed as Germany was left with the weakest of the five and only the weakest of the five.